memorized. First Kings chapter 13, uh, beginning in verse 1. By the word of the Lord, the man of God came from Judah to Bethel, as Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make an offering. He cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord, O altar, altar, this is what the Lord says, a son named Josiah will be born to the house of David. On you he will sacrifice the priests of the high places who now make offerings here, and human bones will be burned on you. That same day the man of God gave a sign. This is the sign the Lord has declared. The altar will be split apart, and the ashes on it will be poured out. When King Jeroboam heard what the man of God cried out against the altar at Bethel, he stretched out his hand from the altar and said, Seize him! But the hand he stretched out towards the man shriveled up so that he could not pull it back. Also, the altar was split apart and its ashes poured out according to the sign given by the man of God by the word of the Lord. Then the king said to the man of God, Intercede with the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored. So the man of God interceded with the Lord and the king's hand was restored and became as it was before. Here ends our reading. Uh, there's a response of thankfulness printed for you in your bulletins. The word of the Lord. Thanks, be to God. Thanks indeed. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we are grateful that you love us and that out of your love you've given us instruction not only for salvation, but also for life. Uh, thank you for caring for us for eternity, giving us knowledge of salvation through the good news of your son, Jesus, but also that you don't leave us here, as Jim said earlier, to flounder about, to, to wonder what your will is about how to live in this life. Uh, we pray that you would instruct us in both ways, uh, teach us the good news of Jesus, and direct us in the way we should live for our good and that our lives might bring glory to you. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was maybe fourth grade, maybe fifth, uh, we lived uh, just south of Rochester, New York, and we lived uh, on about eight acres, and, and uh, behind our house was a shed, and, and it was a permanent shed. It was concrete block, like cinder block uh, shed, probably 12 by 10, something like that, and we kept our you know, lawnmower in there, and, and we had a, 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 our German Shepherd was in there too, and, and he had an outdoor that he could go and from there, but he could come in there as well. And, and um, on the back of the shed, there was a door to the front of it, and uh, we had a gas pump there. That was cool, because we had tractors and stuff like that, so we could go up and actually do our gas uh, there. But behind it was this window in the back that gave light inside the shed. And uh, my friend and I, one time, were we're behind the shed, and there was a hill going down between the shed and our barn. And on this hill was gravel, and the gravel was like that, about that size of gravel. Yeah. And so as boys in the fourth grade do, you have various contests about anything. And at the time, we didn't have video games, so we were having contests about you know throwing sticks and rocks and making holes and those kind of exciting things that we did back then. And so we had a contest of who could hit the window with one of these rocks, you know, the back shed window. And so we did that, we did that, we kept not, you know, kept, kept hitting the, the cinder block wall. And then finally, you know, I, I threw one and I hit it and I was like, yeah! Oh. <laughs> I hit that window, pop, you know, and, and there was that rock-shaped hole in, in, in the window. And of course, we quickly realized that now there was evidence that I had hit the window. And so I just went on from that, hoping my dad would never realize. <laughs> um, but eventually, I don't know how much longer it was, uh, my dad and I were back there in the driveway and by the shed, and we went down to the barn, which is a, a typical thing for us to do, and he stopped and turned around and he said, John, do you know anything about that, that hole in the back window of the shed? And so I did what any good faithful son did. I lied. 
I said, no, I don't know. And uh, he explained to me, he said, you know, I heard this story in a number of contexts. It was always helpful, actually. He said one time, he, he was a pitcher in baseball in high school. My dad played pitcher on the baseball team. He said, I was practicing in the living room. Um, <laughs> and I, just, I had a baseball in my hand, and I would wind up, and I would throw like this, but I wouldn't let the ball go. You know, and I'd just carry it with me, and then I'd practice again. And my dad said to me, he said, Carl, um, don't quit, quit doing that. You know, you, you might, that ball might fall out of your hand. And he said, no, Dad, I won't let it go. And so, you know, very probably the very next throw, and my dad's telling me this, I did it one more time, he said, and, and the ball slipped out of my hand, and it went on my dad's bare toes. <laughs> and he said, I felt so awful. He said, but I know, John, sometimes you do things and you don't think about the consequences and then something bad happens and sometimes we do something stupid. Did you throw a rock through that window at this time? I realized he had given me grace. And I said, yeah, that was me. My chin was quivering and I was crying and that kind of thing. And, and he was very gracious with me and he said, really, I know sometimes we do dumb things in life, and we'll get the window fixed, uh, but, you know, think about things before you do them. Think about, you know, think about that next time you're in a situation like that. Uh, but it was my dad's graciousness to me, telling him, telling me that he, when he was even older than I was at that time, he was in high school and I was in fourth grade, that he had done something stupid and that had caused his father, whom he loved very much, uh, pain. Uh, and that enabled me then to confess what I had done to my father. Um, this passage gets at, and you see there, and I thought about a more complicated, you know, the Puritans had sermon titles that were like three sentences long. So I thought about a longer title for this, but I thought, you know, I just want you to get the impact of this. God is gracious. And this affects not just our eternity, but it affects our lives and how we live our life. Uh, both how we live our life toward God, but how we live our lives toward other people in a, a couple of different directions. And, and so that's what this, one of the things this passage gets at and that we'll discuss this morning. So number one, if you'd like to fill out uh, blanks in your outline, um, remember the graciousness of God. In your life, as you live your life, always remember that God is, is gracious. A, there in your outline, God's graciousness here in this passage, to wicked idolaters like Jeroboam. And I remind you, if you haven't been here for the last couple of weeks, I think you all have, at least one of the two weeks, this altar spoken of here was not the altar in the temple in Jerusalem. It was a, a, a renegade, a rebel altar. God said, you only offer sacrifices on the altar that I have prescribed, the bronze altar in the temple just outside the temple in the temple courtyard in Jerusalem. And you don't, you're not to sacrifice anywhere else. God was clear about that. And we looked at passages about that two weeks ago. And so Jeroboam has established an altar in Bethel and another one up in Dan, two different places uh, in, in the southern part of northern Israel. It was Bethel and then the northern, northernmost part in Israel, which was Dan. And so the, God sends this, this man of God, that's a, a synonym for prophet, up to preach against this altar while Jeroboam is there. And so Jeroboam, and, and you, can, you can read here at the end of, of chapter 12 from 25 on down, just how bad Jeroboam is. And that, that, that's two sermons ago, just all the ways he's transgressing the specific commands of God that God had given to his people through Moses about how to worship him where to worship him, and all this kind of thing. But even if you didn't know that, you can look at those verses, 25 through uh, 33 there, and see that he's saying that these golden calves that have been erected next to these altars were the gods that led them out of Egypt. And so Jeroboam's up to no good. He's up to no good because he wants the people's faithfulness to him which God had promised him anyway in chapter 11. He said, Jeroboam, just be faithful to me, and I'll give you a lasting dynasty. 
But Jeroboam isn't faithful to the Lord. He thinks he has to do it himself, and so he creates uh, alternative or competing altars for the people, the ten tribes under him, uh, to go to. And, and so we see that, that Jeroboam's a bad guy. Um, and, and, and we see later in the history of northern Israel that Jeroboam is still talked about as the initiation of the people's sins in northern Israel. And they were, they were exiled in 722 B.C. Uh, Judah, the southern kingdom, isn't exiled until about 600. So the, the sin of northern Israel was 120 years worse. <laughs> it brought judgment 120 years faster than the sin of the southern kingdom brought judgment uh, to them. And so, so Jeroboam's an idolater. He's literally brought this idol, this golden calf, and he hasn't just said, worship our God, Yahweh, the Lord, by giving attention to this golden calf. He's actually said, this golden calf is your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Uh, but God is gracious to him. Um, and this passage informs us, here's your blank here, God's graciousness to wicked idolaters like Jeroboam informs us that he is willing to be gracious, gracious to great sinners. And so chapter 12, 26 through 33 establishes Jeroboam was wicked, and this altar was wicked, and what Jeroboam was up to was wicked. And Jeroboam says, seize this prophet, this man of God. And imprison him or maybe put him to death. We don't know what Jeroboam's intentions are at this point. But, but God should not treat Jeroboam well. Um, verse 4, Jeroboam says, seize him. Yet, verse 6, look at verse 6. Yet God, in verse 6, after this wicked worship, after seeking the prophet's life, perhaps, at least imprisoning him, um, God heals Jeroboam in graciousness upon Jeroboam's simple request. Jeroboam doesn't say, I'll be better, I promise. He doesn't say, I'll get rid of the golden calves here in, in Dan. I'll get rid of this altar. I'll tell my people to go and worship you down in Jerusalem as you pre has prescribed in the law of Moses. He, he, he simply you know, appeals uh, verse 6, intercede with the Lord your God. Notice he says, your God. Not our God, not my God. But the Lord your God, and pray for me that my hand may be restored. Um, and just note here, um, you know, the, the man of God doesn't rebuke him. He just intercedes for him. And God is gracious. Uh, second half of that verse, the king's hand was restored and became as it was before. So this passage teaches us something about God, and that something is God is gracious, and he's even gracious to, to, to great or terrible sinners. So number one, number one. So we learn here that there is no sin so big, that's your blank, no sin so big, I mean, that's about as big as you can get, right? Worshiping another God, and convincing other people to do that as well. He has all these people, the, the bulk of God's people, ten tribes under him, and he leads them early, first thing in his kingship. You know, this first act. You know, what, what, what's the president sign like on his first, or uh, not divine fiat, what, what's he sign? Executive orders. He gives an executive order to do all these wicked things. Build, the, build these idols and worship at these places instead of where the Lord has designed. So this tells us there's no sin so big. And secondly, there in your, your line there, there is not a number of sins, not a quantity of sins, that exceeds God's limit of graciousness. And so this is what we saw in our declaration of the gospel. You can turn there to refresh yourself on the front page. 1 Timothy 1, 1, 15 and 16. This is the Apostle Paul talking about himself. And we remember that Paul used to be called Saul. And when he was Saul, in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, we realize that he's kind of the authority figure 
who was there in chapter 7 when the order was given for Stephen, one of the first deacons in the church, Acts chapter 6, one of the first deacons in the church, Stephen proclaims the whole Old Testament and says, and by the way, this is all about Jesus and it's all been fulfilled in him. And they stone Stephen. And Paul, or Saul, is there giving his approval to this act. Uh, a persecutor of the church. And then after that, in Acts chapter 8, he gets permission from the, the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem to go to Damascus that he might imprison and put to death more Christians, more people who are following Jesus, especially among, from among the Jews. And so... 1 Timothy 1.15, this is why Paul says there, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. In other words, get this. Christ Jesus came into the world to save not the nice people, not people who are being faithful. He came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst he was person. Other people were just sinning. He was using authority in God's name to kill those who were following God, to kill those who received his son, discouraging people like Jeroboam, right? That's who Paul, that's who Saul was. Discouraging people from following the one true God. Discouraging discouraging people from sending the king that God the Father had sent. In Jeroboam's day, that was Rehoboam. And so Paul knew what it was like to be Jeroboam. And so he says there, of whom I am the worst, I'm the worst sinner. For that very reason, because I was the worst sinner, I was shown mercy. Why was the worst sinner, me, Paul says, shown mercy? So that, for this purpose, in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and might receive eternal and would receive eternal life. So know very clearly with Jeroboam and with Paul, there is no sin too big for Jesus to forgive. And there's no number of sins that is too many for Jesus to forgive. That's part of what Paul's getting at and what Jim read for us in Romans 8. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? So if God the Father ch chose you, and brought you his spirit, regenerated you unto life, gave you eyes to see and ears to hear, and you believed. Who will bring a charge against you that will stick? And that's a rhetorical question. Nobody will. Um, Satan is the great accuser. Um, he might try to bring a charge against you, but it won't stick because the blood of Jesus has washed your sins away through your faith in him. And so Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Think about final judgment. If God is for you, who can be against you? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? That is, who will bring any charge against you? It is God who justifies. And he selected you before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1 4. He sent Jesus, and Jesus bore your sins in his body on the cross. He sent his spirit to regenerate you, to give you spiritual life so that you could see and hear the gospel and believe, and he gave you a heart of flesh so that you could. So, why would any accusation, any sin that you've actually done, it's not that the accusation's false, it's just that it won't stick and it won't separate you. From the love of God in Christ. So it is God who justifies. Who is it that condemns? Not Satan. Not anyone that will accuse you for a sin that you've actually committed. Who is it that commit, condemns? 
It is Christ Jesus who condemns, who died, more than that, who was raised to life and is at the right hand of God and is also not condemning you, but who is interceding for us. Like this man of God. Right? Jesus said, all scripture speaks of me. Okay, so we see it here. You know, this man of God is, is like Jesus. Um, turn to Matthew 12. Just, you know, something, you're always learning from Scripture. And so I learned this today while I was eating breakfast. And I thought, that would have been convenient to have as another verse on that sermon point. Well, I'll just mention it orally. So, uh, Matthew 12, verse 9. I was thinking about this shriveled hand um, this morning. I don't know why while I was eating breakfast. My eggs weren't shriveled or anything. Um, uh, Matthew 12, verse 9, that's page 888 in my Bible. Um, ha, ha, ha. Um, going on from that place, Jesus went into their synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand, lo and behold. This man of God in 1 Kings 13, yeah, that happened in neural history, but it was to foreshadow what Jesus would do here. And ultimately what he'll do with all sickness and, and deformity in the new heavens and new earth. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there looking for, uh, looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. The Pharisees asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of that sheep and lift it out? How much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Remember we mentioned this morning, I mentioned, but you agreed with me, I presume, that the Sabbath is a day of restoration. Jesus understood what the Sabbath meant. And when he's conflicting with the Pharisees, it's usually on this point. They didn't understand why the Sabbath was in place. And he said, it's a gift of God for you. I didn't create the Sabbath for you to obey. I created the Sabbath for you to have as a gift. I created the Sabbath for, for the benefit of man, so that you wouldn't be working seven hours a day and be like Jack Nicholson, right? All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Um, uh, that, 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 um, and, and so Jesus is conflicting with them and saying, the Sabbath is a day for people to be restored through their rest. This is why it's okay to walk through the grain fields and eat, because eating is restoration. Not eating, fasting on the Sabbath day is breaking you down and making you weak so that you walk into the next day not able to serve your man and love him with your labor. And so Jesus goes at them and says, David got it. When his men were famished, they ate the old stale bread that went on the table of the bread of presence, which is, quote, this is an air quote, Jesus doing air quotes, not lawful, wink, wink, for them to eat. But David understood the Sabbath. He understood it was a day and the laws of God were there for, God, for God's people to be restored. And so Jesus makes the point to them, which the Pharisees probably didn't get here, but he says, this is a day for people to be restored. And that's why in the law it says it's okay to bring your ox out of the ditch, if it's fallen out of the ditch, or a sheep, because it's a day of restoration. Not a day of you saying, well, i got to rest. Sorry, I hope you don't die until tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Okay. Um, verse 13, and he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely, keyword restored. Think of that with Sabbath. That's why we rest on the Lord's day. We want to be restored. Uh, just as, uh, and it was just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, this guy's doing a lot of good for us. Let's kill him. Uh, that's part of Matthew's point as he writes to Jews. The reason Jesus was crucified was nothing to do with logic. Uh, but but uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, man is, is restored on this, on this day. Uh, so verse uh, Romans chapter 8, Paul goes on, And all these things were more than conquerors through him who loved us, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor your own sin, 
nor anything in all creation will be able, key point here, to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. No sin too big, no number of sins too great to separate you. Paul's just named everything he can think of that someone might think would separate them from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Okay. Um, so to put another way, number two, Christ's death is big enough. Christ's death is big enough to cover every sin of each of his people. Uh, at Christmas time, we hear this. We don't often think of it in terms of uh, definite atonement or, or, or that, that your, all your sins were in Jesus' body on the cross, but certainly it is. Uh, the angel says to Matthew, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So Jesus saves his people from their sins. That's his job. If he doesn't do that for you, and you're one of his people, the Father's elected you, and he doesn't do that, then Jesus has failed in his job. He's let his Father down. But that's not true. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 24. Jesus himself bore, in his, bore our sins in his body on the tree. Romans 5, 20. But where sin increased, grace increased increased all the more. You can't out -sin the blood of Jesus. There was no sin that you can surprise God with. When Jesus was on the cross, all your sin, all my sin, was in the future, and he knew each one. We're not surprising him in our lives. And Jesus bore in his body all our sins on the tree. On the cross. Okay? Um, if you say, well, God couldn't forgive this, mentioning a sin that you think is just so big, you're just wrong. God the Father knew it, placed it upon Jesus' body, Jesus willingly took it upon himself and died for it. And on the cross, all of God's wrath against all your sin, all however many number of them there will be until you see him face to face, either through death or his return, all your sins were in Jesus' body on the cross. And what's the penalty for sin? Death. What's Jesus do bearing your sins on the cross? Dies. All God's wrath goes out against your sin on the cross. And so if you say, well, certainly God can't forgive this, guess who you're insulting? Jesus. Anyone want to be in the business of insulting Jesus? How about this one? I just don't know if I can forgive myself. What in the world are you talking about? Are you a, God above, are you a judge above God? Is your standard of holiness above God's standard? God has forgiven you of all your sins, but you can't forgive yourself. Oh, let me bow down to you, Miss High and Mighty. You see how ridiculous that is to say, I don't know if I can forgive myself. Hey, get with the gospel program, right? If I hear that again, I'm going to barf, right? If you say that, quit saying that and believe the gospel. I'm not mad at you, but I'm mad that you've heard that term and you think that's true. Right? There's nowhere in the Bible that says you need to forgive yourself. That, that phrase is not in the Bible. You're not the judge. Jesus did say that, Matthew 7. You're not the judge, so don't judge others. Matthew 7, 7. Where's my old license plate frame? Miss said, Matthew 7, 17. <laughs> Here's Matthew 7, 7. Judge not. Jesus said, all judgment, Jesus said, has been given to me by the Father, John 5. Okay, You're not the judge. It's not your job to grant forgiveness. That's Jesus' job. Okay, um, And so when you sin, you need to exercise your faith that you've already had in the gospel and say, this has been 
forgiven. God has forgiven it. He designed to forgive it before he created anything. That was what election was about. Um, he spilled out all his wrath against that sin 2,000 years ago when Jesus bore that sin in his body on the cross and God the Father spilled out his wrath in justice against Jesus to, boy, that sounded bad, sorry, against Jesus um, uh, on the cross uh, so that his justice is fulfilled toward that. And with God, he's just. There's no double jeopardy. He doesn't punish Jesus and then punish you too. Um, so we don't call Jesus' death inadequate. The writer of Hebrews gets at this. Um, he talks about somebody uh, being saved and then thinking they're not saved anymore and then having to come to faith again or some kind of scenario like that. And he talks about that as trampling the blood of Jesus underfoot. And we don't want to trample the blood of Jesus or call the blood of Jesus inadequate or not strong enough or having, it, or having not completed its task. Part of Jesus being faithful to the Father was that his death took upon, uh, d did what the Father intended to accomplish through him. Jesus took all the wrath for all your sins upon himself. And our, our obedience to him now is not to escape his wrath. His wrath has already been spent against our sins. Our obedience now is because we love him. We want to glorify him. We want to be like him. We want to walk in his ways. That's half of it, to glorify God. And the other reason is because God calls sin stupid, right? That's dumb for us. We have natural consequences that we experience when we don't walk in God's ways. And so we've got two motivations not to sin, and neither of those motivations, the glory of God, and that I don't bring natural consequences on myself, right? If I tell off my boss, you know, if I say, you know, you're so stupid, I watch the... Uh, um, Seinfeld episode this week written by Larry David about uh, George telling off his boss because his boss sent out a memo that said you can't use the executive bathroom anymore. And so George, George goes in and he tells his boss off, you're stupid and everyone's making fun of you out there. Um, and then George realizes he doesn't have another job to go to and so he just shows up next Monday at work like nothing happened. <laughs> oh, you thought I was serious. Oh, you... But, but, but there are natural, but George gets fired. They're not natural consequences from our sins, from the things we do. Um, and so we don't sin because we want to be like God. We want to fulfill our destiny, be, be an image of God on the earth. And we don't sin because we, want, we don't want to experience the natural consequences of our sins. So I don't throw another rock through that shed window, right? Then I'd be in trouble. <laughs> I got understanding the first time. God, my, my father would have still been gracious with me. Uh, but it would have been tougher. Um, so B, B. Um, thus, because this, it, it, God is gracious and the death of Jesus is so big and so adequate, never believe in the, also looking toward others, never believe in the unlikelihood of a really sinful, un disbelieving person becoming a Christian. And I put it, that's the way I wanted to put it, but they tell you when pr you preach, put in the positive. So I had kind of a double negative there. So here's your positive. Thus, believe that all people can potentially be saved. What we mean by this is that person who is uh, spewing atheism right now and making fun of you because of your faith, or that person who has a, Muslim background and will be disowned by his family, but as one of your co-workers or a neighbor or that kind of thing. Don't look at that person and think, oh, they'll never believe. Remember the Apostle Paul. Okay. Um, God is gracious. He was gracious to Jeroboam. He was gracious to Saul. Uh, so always believe that all people can be potentially saved. We don't know if they're elect or not. But we know that it doesn't matter what they look like right now. What matters is if they are elect, which we'll never know. So we just share the gospel and let God work. 
And maybe he'll regenerate that person on the spot and they'll say, you know what, I've been resisting this all my life, but I don't know why. And, and, and we'll see faith right there before us. Maybe it's just something that'll stick in their head and six years later, having not been able to get rid of this, that Jesus is God and forgives sins and, you know, Kirk's always been nice to me at work. Why have I been resisting this? And six years later, they come to faith. But believe that all people can be potentially be saved. All can come to faith in Jesus. Uh, C. Another angle on this, the graciousness of God. So with the graciousness of God, first of all, know that all your sin, none of your sins are too big and know that your sins are not too many. Second thing, know that any unbeliever that you know can come to faith. You know, when we say, oh, they'll never believe, God's just laughing, you know, if that person is, is, is of his elect. And even if they're not, God's laughing. It's like, you don't believe I could, I could make, you know, God's not going to change his election, but, you know, I'd be tempted, right, to do that, just to show you up. You know, he can change anybody. Um, now, C, uh, know that God's graciousness to wicked idolaters uh, who were among his people, Jeroboam. Remember, Jeroboam is in covenant with God. He's one of God's people. He's a member of one of the ten tribes. He's from the tribe of Ephraim. God's graciousness to wicked idolaters who were among his people, like Jeroboam, shows us that he will be gracious to you when you sin. In other words, God's is, God is not just gracious to you before you come to Christ and also gracious to those who have not yet come to Christ and bringing to them salvation, but God is also gracious to those like you who have come to Christ, come to faith in Jesus, and sin. Big sins. And keep sinning. And have many sins. God is gracious here with a big sinner who is in covenant with him. If you've been in Sunday school, a big boxer, Jeroboam. Okay, in covenant with God, but sinning really big. Not just sinning for himself, but leading other people down a path of sin. And God is gracious to Jeroboam. And all Jeroboam says to that man of God is, Intercede for me, and God just heals him. God is gracious toward this great sinner who's a member of the church back then. So number one, number one, you uh, still may have to face natural consequences of sins in your life. Uh, so uh, God's word comes true. There are certain disciplines that, that come, and so uh, the uh, uh, when you don't, uh, when you uh, you know yell at your boss, you may have consequences for that. When you don't do what your parents tell you to do, you may have consequences for that. Uh, when you don't uh, do your homework assignment, you'll have consequences for that. Whatever authority is above you, when you don't do what your authority has said, there will be consequences. Uh, but you're kind of walking through this verse, these verses that I've listed for you. Verse two: When there's false worship. Um, uh, in 2 Kings 23, um, there's this proclamation to you because of this false worship that um, you priests who are leading this false worship, your bones will be dug up, the man of God says, and burnt as a sign of God's curse uh, when, Jer when a, a descendant of David comes along named Josiah. And that happens in 2 Kings 23, 15 through through. 20. Um, Leviticus 26 said there would be a covenant curse of exile if God's people departed from their worship of him and they refused to listen to the prophets. That the worst of all covenant curses, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, was exile. And that indeed happens to northern Israel in 2 uh, Kings chapter, chapter 17. Um, or as Paul put it in Galatians 6, uh, God will not be mocked. A man will reap what he sows. And the man who sows toward his sinful nature will reap the whirlwind. Chaos, in other words. But those who reap toward, toward God, toward, their spirit, toward the Spirit of God within them, will reap blessing and fruitfulness in their lives. Uh, so you still may face natural consequences for your sins when you sin in your life. But number two, two but God will not cast you away. He will not cast you away. 
Um, Deuteronomy 31.8 will be our benediction today. It's one that I've, I've said recently to you. Um, the, the Lord himself goes before you and be, will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Okay, now this is Moses talking to God's people before they went into the promised land. The Lord himself will go before you. He'll fight the battle but he gives this promise to his covenant people. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. And this promise is repeated to us in, in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews 13.5. That's what the writer of Hebrews is, is quoting. Behold, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. And so when you sin, know that. And if you think, boy, this is really a big sin, and I've surprised even myself, know that the Lord will not forsake you. He will not cast you away. Um, 1 Peter uh, 2, uh, 1, sorry, 1 Peter 1, 2 through 5, and you call for call to worship. You can look at that. Um, you are shielded through faith by the power of God until the coming of salvation, which will be revealed when Jesus comes back. You are shielded by the power of God. God will keep you in covenant. He will preserve your faith to the end, and you will rejoice at the coming of Jesus. Um, and then number three, in other words, and, and just to review some we've talked about, if the Father elected you, that's Ephesians 1.4, if the Spirit regenerated you to spiritual life, that is, if he gave you spiritual birth, regenerated, that's your blank, that's Titus 3.5, he gave you life by his Spirit, he regenerated you to spiritual life, gave you spiritual birth, then it also means that if he has regenerated you, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, that means Jesus bore your sins, all your sins, that's your blank, all your sins in his body on the cross. If he hadn't borne your sins, the spirit wouldn't have regenerated you to life and the gospel would never have made sense. And if the spirit did that, that meant the father elected you before the creation of the world, Ephesians 1, 4, and that Jesus came to the earth 2,000 years ago to bear your sins in his body and a cross, 1 Peter 2, 24. Um, so Romans 5, 9 is true. Since we have now been justified by Jesus' blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? So if you believed, don't worry. Don't worry. God will not cast you out. You may have natural consequences for your sins that God especially allows to come to you to discipline you or to train you in righteousness as we've talked about recently. But he will not cast you out. Uh, your eternity is safe. So D, D. Thus always return to the Lord quickly upon your own great or many sins. Always return to the Lord quickly upon your great or many sins, because God will always receive you. Because all of your sins were forgiven 2,000 years ago, when you sin, even though you are surprised, God the Father is not. Jesus is not. Jesus says, yep, I died for that one. I remember that when I took that sin in my body on the cross and suffered the wrath of God for that. God's not surprised. So come to him right away. Even if he were surprised, he saw you do it. <laughs> so that's why we're commended in Scripture, 1 John 1. Confess your sins. This is one of the tests of what a true believer is in 1 John. 1 John's full of all these tests of what a true believer is versus somebody who's a wolf or somebody who just leaves the church. That had happened to the church in Ephesus that Timothy was pastoring. And that's why John writes this letter, 1 John to Timothy, and he gives Timothy all these things to share with the congregation who was still there, as opposed to those who had left. And so 1 John, John says to Timothy, you know, if they had been of us, they would not have left us. Okay. But because they left us, they know they were never, we know they were never of us. Uh, and, and one of the signs that God gives, how do you know who a real Christian is? 1 John 1, verses 7 through 9. A real Christian is one who confesses his sins because he knows his eternity is safe. 
when your eternity is safe, when you understand the gospel that all your sins were in Jesus' body on the cross, confessing your sins doesn't earn you eternal punishment or jeopardize your eternal punishment because your eternal punishment was taken care of 2,000 years ago on the cross. So don't hesitate when you sin to come to the Father right away and to confess your sin. And to say, Father, I know that you know this, but you told me confess my sins to you. So I confess this to you. And, and, and I know this was wrong. Um, and, and that's what John calls stepping back into the light. Instead of hiding, going off into the darkness and hoping God doesn't, God doesn't see. Uh, I'm, I'm learning now uh, Psalm 139, and, and, and David says this, you know, even the, the darkness is as light to you. Um, you know, he, he says, sure, I thought surely the darkness will, will hide me. And, and then he says, but, but the night will be as day to you, as light to you. Um, you see all things. And so we come to the Lord and, and we confess our sins. We return to the Lord quickly uh, upon our own great or many sins, knowing that God will always receive us. And so that's what we saw there in Luke chapter 15. That's what Jesus presents to the people as he's talking about sin. And Luke chapter 15, I should have put verse 1 on there too, because the Pharisees were upset that Jesus was eating with tax collectors and sinners. And so Jesus tells three parables about how God always receives sinners who come to him in faith. And one of these parables was the, the parable of the, the lost son who comes to his father and he comes to his father, not quickly, but when he repents of his sin, he comes quickly. And, 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 and you see the father's waiting for him. And the father runs to greet him and says, kill the fatted calf, let's have a celebration. And Jesus is communicating to you, that's how the Father is when you come to him in confession. When you have sinned, when you have been the, the prodigal son, even just 30 seconds ago for a sin that lasted two seconds, when you confess that sin, the Father's response to that confession is the response of that father of the prodigal son. He rushes to you. He sees your repentance and he comes to you and he says, kill the fatted calf. Okay, so return to the Lord quickly. That's the lesson there. Now, practical points for your living. Okay? I always hate when people say, well, let's give us something practical. Oh, sorry, I just taught you about God. I know that's real junk. <laughs> None of you do that. I used to have that a long time ago. Uh, but but there, there always is practical stuff out of truth. Everything about God has true implications because we're to be like God. We're to be godly. Okay, so here's some practical things for you that come out of this truth that God is gracious. So practical thing number one, parents, this is for you. And you future parents, this is for you. Parents, be gracious to your kids. God the Father, in his fatherhood, in his parenthood of you, was gracious to you. Be gracious. Uh, to your kids. Be like God in Christ who forgives all sins and disciplines toward improvement, not with anger. Okay, and that can be tricky sometimes. Uh, but discipline for improvement because you care about your kid. Being gracious and at the same time, while, here's your while clause here, while yet holding up holding up the standard of biblical behavior. There's not a divorce between being gracious and holding up biblical behavior. So that your kids, here's why you're gracious, so that your kids will be free to come to you. So uh, we talked about a couple of things as deacons and elders. Uh, two Saturdays ago, we had our normal uh, session meeting, but we had the deacons in for a joint meeting together, and we talked about two two things. And, and one is, is potentially um, uh, uh, giving our, our old chairs at the dojo. We gave them to Redeemer, and it turns out they didn't need them. They were building an addition. They didn't need them. And so we uh, um, found that out. And so we, you know, I, I want to approach Eddie and Ponder, who own this place, about uh, offering our chairs to them. Um, and then also we talked about you know, maybe having a bigger screen here. You know, maybe we could do that. 
And I was really nervous about this because I'm an introvert and, and I respect authorities. And so I didn't want to come to them and I knew I'd be kind of sweaty and nervous. And oh, but I knew they'd want to talk to me because I've been their you know, point talk person since 1999 and that kind of thing. And then, you know, I was driving up, I had coffee with Emily down at 1442 and I was driving up and I didn't even call ahead of time because I was nervous about calling and what to say, that kind of thing. I'll just pop in on them. You know, like when you're trying for a date with someone you like and you're trying to make a casual. That's another Seinfeld episode too. It's a great one where George hangs, or Jerry hangs out in the lobby of this woman that he wants to date. He knows where she works, but he doesn't know her name or her phone number. Uh, but So I just popped in, but on the way up here, literally on Route 42, I said, why am I nervous? Everything we've ever needed from Eddie and Pandra, they've done for us. They've given us. You know, they say, oh, you want coffee? Just use our coffee. Just use our coffee maker. Oh, you need, you know, so we have a Christmas party and we order food. And so Eddie hands us our bill and he's done this more than once. We don't presume this is true, but I had forgotten it. He hands me the bill on, on January 4th or whatever it was. And I open the bill and it has the, all the stuff that we had ordered for our Christmas party. And it says all, those, all these things listed, no charge. Thank you for being a part of the Rainbow Lanes family. Why am I nervous asking them about giving them chairs and buying them a bigger TV? Why am I nervous? That made no sense at all. And I want you to have, and so I was not nervous then. And I came in here and luckily Ponder was here filling in for somebody who didn't show up for work. She was making a sandwich there. I said, hey Ponder, I said, I got a couple ideas I want to run by you about our worship space. If it's a good time, if not, we can talk some other time. And she said, oh, no, that's fine. Let me just finish with this sandwich. I'll grab Eddie. And uh, so I talked to him, and they were delighted. You know, wh why didn't I just think that at first? You know, they've always been for our good. And when we did officer's training, they just, Eddie said, now, John, I want you to know. Um, I can do a pretty good Eddie, but I won't do it. He said, I just, I just want you to know this is just part of your rent. There's nothing extra for this. Whenever you need this place, you can just have it. That's just, that's just part of the deal. You know, we use that for six months, two, two hours every Saturday morning, you know, for six months and no extra charge. But, but that's the way we want to be with God. This is a good God. This is the prodigal father. You know, and he wants our good. He's like, boy, I hope he comes home so I can just show him how good I am and, and, and give him joy. And, and he can invite his friends and we can have a big party. Um, and, and that's, so, that, so that's, that's the thing you want to parents, you want to be this way with your kids so they are not hesitant to come towards you because they have, a con they're convinced beyond all reasonable doubt that your good, their good is in your mind and, and um, that, that you'll be uh, happy. And you know, parents, you know, it's like, you know, if your kid ever come, came to you and said, you know, dad, I, you may not have seen it yet, but I threw rocks through the window. My dad would have been so proud. I mean, he would have been, why'd you do that? But still, to confess that, you know, that's something to be proud about your, your son and your daughter about. Um, so, so know that. Uh, Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So, so have your kids know there'll be forgiveness there for them. Um, uh, Ephesians 6, 4, fathers do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So, so parents, teach your kids how to behave. Uh, 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 but, but be gracious and forgiving toward them. Give instruction to them. Uh, hold up the standard um, like my dad did with the, sh with the shed. Now, second thing, kids, this is for you. Kids, uh, go to your parents and admit your sins against their rules. If they've got some rule, something you've done that's against their rules, go to them. Remember the prodigal father and his response. Now, parents, I, I mentioned you first. <laughs> you got to be like that. But kids, go to your parents and, and, and with what you've done um, and, 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 and trust that you'll find this response. Now, third, Members of the church, members, that's your blank there, come to your session. Come to your session with your sins and struggles. Quickly, your line, next line. Uh, this is very, so closely related. 
don't seek to impress your session. If you are impressing us, I, I, I'm going to tell you something that's 100% sure. You are not impressing us. We see people who are trying to impress us, and that is just a red flag of spiritual immaturity. And you can, you can spot trying to impress us from a mile away. Okay? And I don't see any of you trying to impress us. Stay that way. You know who impresses us? Someone who comes to us and says, I'm really struggling with something. Can you help me? We're like, wow. You know, that takes guts, and, and they don't care about the approval of men. Um, they care about the approval of God, approval of God and the, the approval of God, and they're not doing well. And they care that they'll be doing well with God. And, and they're humiliating themselves before us, their spiritual authorities. And, and we as a session, we see that and we, we, literally, we look at each other and say, wow. We've been in church discipline issues like that. And we've had people come to us and they tell us all these ugly things they've done or embarrassing things we've done. And, and they go away and we're like, wow, that's so great. And we're impressed with them because their understanding of who God is is I have a forgiving God, so I can admit not, nothing can harm me. Even if my session rejects me, my God doesn't. He's forgiven all my sins. And if my session is anything like God is, and I trust that they are, they'll forgive me too. And they will meet my sins with helpful instructions, which is what I want, because I'm experiencing the natural consequences of my sins, or... God's been gracious to me, and I haven't met those natural consequences, but I sense maybe the next time I do this, I will. And I want to reform before that happens so that God doesn't have to allow that to come upon me. So don't be, uh, so come to your session with your sins and struggles. So many people's lives shipwrecked are because they didn't come to their sessions. They didn't come to their elders for help and they could have gotten help. And they could have been, and things would have been so much better. And some of you have come to the session, and I remember those times, I'm looking around here, where you came and you were in trouble and, 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 and had gotten in a place where you were in this pattern of sin, and, and you came wisely in humility and said, my, my walking with Christ is more important than what the session and what my pastor thinks of me. And, and you know what that did for me. You know what that did for the session. Your, our view of you went whoop like this because God lo loves a, a humble and contrite spirit. It's not a proud one. And so um, know that, members. So, um, so come to us with your sin and struggle. Um, know that that's, uh, that's the response you'll get from the session. Parents, be those parents who are gracious to your kids, and uphold God's standard in instructing them, seeing that they've had a hard time with this particular thing. So say, okay, um, like Coach K, when his players would not have a right attitude about something, he would just call them to him and, and say, you know what, this isn't working well for you right now, is it? And it wasn't anger. Um, and it's like, let's, what can we do about this? How can we get you in a better place, both for the way you're playing and the way you're relating with your teammates? Um, and so parents, be that for your kids. And, and kids, come to your parents for help. That's why they're here. You know, most of you, you know, your parents would die for you. Um, and, and so know they'd be willing to help you um, to, to not get yourself in, in, in uh, trouble or to do things that will bring uh, very hard consequences to your life. Okay, we'll end with, we'll end with that. Um, let's pray. Yeah. <laughs>